Hello, everybody, and welcome in to Hello Animal Talks, your ticket to learning about people and organizations around the world who are working for animal welfare. And today, I'm very excited to have here from the Soy Dog Foundation, marketing team leader, Naomi, and she's going to tell us about the Soy Dog Foundation and what they're doing. They are located in Phuket, Thailand and they are on a mission to help all the thousands of um, stray dogs and cats that are on the island. So welcome, Naomi. Hi, Jenny. Very nice to finally talk to you, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to, um, to talk to you. Absolutely. I think what you're doing over there is really amazing and really could be duplicated in other areas of the world that are facing the same situations. You know, you set a good example for people around the world to, to do the same kind of work. It's a big issue. Yes. So the Soy Dog Foundation was, yes, it, the initial idea behind it was just to help the street dogs and cats. And um, it's, I think the success is due to a lot of factors because I think a lot of people want to help animals everywhere but it's a lot of effort and a lot of planning that goes into it and I think Soy Dog is a prime example of how a small organization just started with it, just ordinary people turning into something absolutely extraordinary. Yes well tell us how you got involved with them. So I've been in Soy Dog for I think now almost three and a half years. Um, I actually came in to, I was part of the adoptions team for about two years, and then I moved on to the marketing team. So that's where I've been for the last year and a half. Um, so that's, yeah, so I kind of, um, I've moved on from adoptions where adoptions was getting to know the animals firsthand, working with adopters, um, trying to match adopters to you know the dogs or you know trying to find them a good fit for them. And marketing is, less um, hands-on work, but we work a lot with every team. So we kind of have a good eye on everything that's going on, trying to keep an eye on everything that every team is going on. If it's worth sharing with the rest of you know, our supporters, our followers, then, then we're on it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of what our job entails. That's an important job. So um, tell us how Soy Dog Foundation started. Okay, so it was started by three expats. Um, at the, uh, a Dutch lady called Margot and two British expats, John and Jill Daly. So Margot is not known so much because she was she was but she was an integral part of the beginning of Soy Dog. She was um, she was she was here, I think, before John and Daly came to Phuket and she was sterilizing animals, she was get, trying to get animals, um, injured animals help. Um, and John and Jill also joined forces and initially was just trying to feed the stray dogs. And in Phuket in 2003, when we were officially founded, there's an estimate of about maybe 70,000 street dogs just on the island itself. And, and it's all rough estimates, but there were a lot of dogs and a lot of injured sick dogs. And um, there were some of them were living in temples. Some of them were just roaming the streets. So it was just a way for people expats like like themselves to come together and help the animals but then they realized if they make it more of a legal organization then there is a better opportunity and and more scope to do things and and that's how it started so margot however um left she went back to to the netherlands a few years later and then john and um, jill obviously then took over um, and that's kind of how it started it was all just you know it was just three average people coming to Thailand, you know, they wanted to come and retire. They knew about the soy, um, the soy dog. So um, just to clarify, soy means street in Thai, in Thai language, and that's why soy dog means street dogs. So you would see soy dogs everywhere. And, you know, they wanted to, it was, you know, when you come from a Western country where you don't see such a, you know, just random street animals walking around, it's so difficult not to do something. And, and that's what they did too, but they kind of took it the the extra mile and and decided to do whatever it takes to help the animals. So that was kind of the, yeah, that's how, how they how Soy Dog started. Why is the problem so bad there? Because you said seven, 70,000. Yes. That's, yeah, that's pretty overwhelming. And is there a lot of poverty there that people are not 
able to take care of their pets so they abandon them on the streets and then they reproduce or do you know the origin of of this issue so i think this is a common problem in lots of countries in the world where developing countries in the world so thailand to asia obviously africa maybe south america places like that so it's difficult to identify but the main reason i think is the fact that you know, governments do not, their priority are not street animals. They have other problems going on in countries like this. So if you look at the Western world, you come to that position because you're in a better economic state. So I think the financials, financials and the economy of countries has a major impact on the street animals and the welfare of animals. So, so it, it takes time. And also because spay and neuter is obviously the way forward. And that's kind of, that's the main program that Soydot runs. But in general, in most of these developing countries, running um, comprehensive spay and neuter programs, it just doesn't exist because governments do not have the money. And you talked about abandonment. That's one issue or one contribution to the stray dog uh, population. So we have feral dogs. So, the way I look at it is in Western countries, you would see, like in the US, for instance, you would see a lot of feral um, stray cats. And you have to think of the same thing with dogs, where stray cats are still trying to control the population. There are feral cats who can never be rehomed. You have community cats who are happy where they are as long as there's someone to look after them. So it's the same problem, but we have that with dogs. Whereas in lots of countries like the US, Europe, that problem with the dogs have been managed because there is a bigger risk for humans with dogs running around you know, with rabies and dog bites, whereas with cats, it's also difficult to control because they're smaller, um, but it's, I, I, I think it's the same problem, but we have that with dogs and we're in the process of finding solutions, but it's so massive, it just takes so long. So span neuter is the way forward, but it just takes so long. So 70,000 street animals in Phuket was uh, 17 years ago, but with our spay and neuter program, we have been able to reduce it by at least 80 to 90 percent now. So if you come to Phuket, you don't actually see that many stray dogs, and the ones you see are actually pretty healthy because they have they've all been sterilized, and we are on top of we're managing the situation, and there are people who look after the dogs so they get fed, so there's less diseases. But even then, you know, we get so many still animals who are coming in who are injured, so you still see that, but so it's a long process. And in Thailand, overall, we think the estimate is, um, is, is a rough estimate, but we think there could be at least 10 million straight, um, stray dogs. So these are free roaming dogs who are partly feral, partly community dogs, and dogs who are who, who owned as well, but they come into the population because people don't always keep the dogs inside in their homes. They let them run loose. That's just the way it is. So there are very various contributions to the problem. It's really amazing that they took on such a daunting task and they started out really just going out and feeding them, right? And then they realized that it was not going to get any better unless the reproductive process was interrupted and that then they started with the spain and the neutering yes so john and jill had been to phuket before they decided to retire here and i think they met they met a street dog that i think kind of was the catalyst for soy dog years before and when they and they knew that one day they were going to come back and they were going to try and they were going to retire here and also do something for the soy dogs and yes spay and neuter you know, feeding, you have to feed them because there's just so much suffering and there's so many dogs who are, don't have food, at least back in the days in Phuket. And alongside that, they did, you know, they did sterilization. So they had a, the vet was an American vet who was here. Um, I'm not 100% sure where you know, she was from, but a vet was here um, volunteering to sterilize dogs and cats and they kind of worked with them. And over time, we had obviously a lot of, a lot of things have happened. The tsunami came just be before that. John, I'm um, sorry, Jill lost her legs because she was, they were darting a dog to be sterilized and she ran into a, a buffalo, um, like a swamp and, and then her legs caught a, a, a germ. And that's a whole different story, but so many things happened, but all along that they wanted to, the spay and neuter has always been the 
primary um, focus of Soy Dog. And alongside that, we built other programs because there are so many issues that come with such a massive population crisis of dogs, stray dogs. Right. And so you're not only doing the spaying and the neutering, but also taking care of whatever wounds and diseases they come in with. Is that right? Yes. So it's, it, you know, with so many large, um, large population of animals, you can't bring them in. And that's a frequent question that people give, you know, ask us because if they see, they're like, oh, why aren't you taking this dog in? Why aren't you helping this dog? This dog is on the road. When you have that many number of animals, you know, we might need an island that's bigger than Phuket to hold all the dogs in Thailand. It's not feasible. It's not good for their welfare. So the only animals we take in are vulnerable and injured animals. And if they have a feeder or if the area is safe or if someone comes forward to say, I know this dog, I can look after this dog, then we release them back to where they were found. However, there are always going to be animals who are run over by vehicles. We have to amputate their legs, maybe some of them lose eyes, some of them there could have been cruelty so involved so we kind of investigate each case and then we decide our vets and our animal welfare team decides whether the animals should go back or not so yes so we still get in a lot of animals so on a daily basis um, obviously this year the numbers have increased due to covid but um, on an average maybe 20 animals come in a day for treatment and that's every single day. It could be 15 or 20 animals. Some of them could be kittens who are abandoned or kittens who lost their mums. Dogs have been met by accidents. Um, and they come in, they come in for treatment. And then at the end of their treatment period, we will decide, are these animals going to stay with us? Can they be adopted out? Or is it better for them to live in their familiar territory where they're getting fed, where they're happier, rather than being in a shelter environment with lots of other animals, which creates lots of you know, problems in the future. So we always try and think of what's best for them and then make that decision. So treatment and rescue is another important aspect of what we do. And are people bringing these animals to you or do you get phone calls that somebody's seen an animal is hurt or somebody knows of an animal that's in a bad situation and you go out and find it? It's a mix of both. Um, so we have animal rescue sort of teams uh, who are out and about in Phuket and when we get calls we get lots of messages from people as well they know about us or they they find an injured animal and they google us and they find us and they message us we also have a network of feeders so these are all locals who look after the animals in their community and they will obviously feed the animals so they know the animals or they will see an animal they're in the neighborhood out with the animals so they will give us a call or they will message us and say look i've seen this dog it doesn't look well, can you come and have a look? So yeah, it's a mix of both. And we also have a community outreach project. So this is a team of vets and um, assistants who go out in Phuket. We also try and treat these animals in their community rather than bringing them in. So they, they recover much faster. It depends on the injury. And if we have feeders, we give them the medication. So last year, the community outreach program treated almost as many number of animals as the ones who came into the shelter. So that was, I think, about 4,000 animals that we treated last year just um, outside of the shelter within the island of Phuket. Wow, that's a lot. And how do you find these feeders? Do they, are they just people in the neighborhood that volunteer or they were doing it before uh, you all got involved? That's... I think again, it's um, it's a mix of both. You know, it's a it's a Buddhist country, so people do tend to look after animals in different. You know, different people have different ways of looking. It doesn't matter what your religion or where you come from. Some people are naturally drawn to help animals. Some people aren't. So some people, some of these feeders have been feeding them for a while. We've known them for years. Sometimes people move in and they see animals, so they naturally start feeding. And over time, they've come into our feeder network. But some of them. So sometimes we provide them with food as well. So that's another way that our donors' money goes into not just helping the animals within the shelter, but we also help to feed some of the animals as well through the feeders. Some of them do it on their own. Um, so it's, it's, again, a mix. It's a mixed bag of um, how and where these people come from. And are you all doing any kind of education work for the population on, on uh, animal cruelty and neglect and all that kind of thing? Is that a part of what you do? Yes, yes. So we have an education, human education program. We actually, uh, that's been going on for a few years. That's primarily targeting school children, the local schools, because 
as we all know, it starts when you're young, so it's really important to change your mindset. And what we really want to focus on is for little kids to know that street animals, even though they live on the street, are just as important as your pets. And even if you have pets, it's not just having a pet just because it's cute and cuddly or it's a puppy. It's it's a lifelong commitment. So um, the t we have a human education team. We have two um, two staff members who lives with local schools who go out and do talks to the kids and help them do activities. They also come into the shelter sometimes and they have a look around. We also recently opened up our human education office. So it's one of a kind in Thailand. It's based in our shelter. And it was obviously all of it's been funded by our donors and they come here and they will learn activities and they will learn more about the five freedoms that's really important for animals just to just to start them on the right track so we have that program going ongoing for young kids and for adults a little bit more difficult so it's an ongoing thing of you know you kind of go there and show what people do and it's a, it's a learning process as we do it sort of thing so yeah we do have sometimes first aid and um sort of workshops for feeders. We did one of them in Samui Island where we're gonna go next year to do a sterilization um, program. There are lots of groups within the island, a smaller island in, in Thailand. And there are lots of groups doing a lot of work, but they need to come together to, to work. So we're just giving them the support to do that and kind of sharing our experiences over the years of how best to do it and, and how you can work together because everyone's on the same path, but sometimes it's, you just need some bit of a push to um, coordinate between themselves. And what are the five freedoms? I haven't heard of that. Now, I might need to look this up myself, but um, <laughs> And the five freedoms are, it's a, um, it's a universal um, freedoms that's been defined. And I think it started, I can't remember, years ago, um, I think in the UK, and it started for farm animals. So it's about, you know, giving them enough space for them to move around, giving them the freedom to d um, display normal behavior. So it's kind of understanding that you can't just have an animal and treat it like like a teddy bear, for instance. It's understanding that they have needs. They need food and water. They need veterinary care. They need, they have their own personalities and behavior. So giving them that freedom to display those things. So it's kind of refraining people from chaining up animals, feeding animals, making sure that they get fed and a nutritious meal, not just grass. And giving them veterinary care, that's really important because sometimes people think other oh, animals, we just need to give them food and water and they're fine, but no, you need to vaccinate them on time, you need to sterilize them. And, and then going a little bit beyond that is again, understanding they need, they, they have behaviors, like enrichment is important for dogs and for cats and understanding things like that. So you can look it up. Um, I can't remember them um, individually, but that's kind of sums it up. And I think now it's moved on to even more. Those are just the five basic um, freedoms for any living animal. It sounds like uh, that's something we need to uh, get a refresher course on here in the United States because uh, the factory farming situation does not follow those freedoms at all. Yeah, I think we could do a refresher course on that. There's a lot to learn everywhere for all of us. Yeah, there really is. You know, you can think about all the wild animals and the issues they have, but the domestic animals that we're supposed to be taking care of, you know, are close to home and we need to be helping them as well. Okay, so tell us about, I know that you had the tsunami, what, in 2005? Yes, it was 2004 Boxing Day. So that was a, a very big thing for you all yes so obviously I wasn't here at the time but I think that's kind of what helped soy dog in a way to be what it is today because before that it was um, a few volunteers John and Jill working together and when the tsunami happened so I, I mentioned before about Jill so she obviously had this um, sort of unfortunate incident that happened just a few months before the tsunami Basically, they were trying to catch um, a dog, and some of these dogs are feral, so you have to dart them. And the dog just ran into a, a, a swampy area. So Jill, being Jill, just ran after the dog because the dog was going to be unconscious very soon. So she ran after the dog to get the dog, and then she got the dog but then I think the day before her legs were feeling quite funny and her, they were going blue so she was rushed to the hospital and they found out that uh, a bug had 
basically got into her bloodstream and she, her legs were pretty much dying. And I think she went into a coma right after that. And and they had to amputate her legs. They didn't think they could save the arms, but they were able to save her arms and they have to amputate the legs, I think, from knee down. So then, and then just a few, I think just around the same time the tsunami happened, she lost her best friend during the tsunami. And obviously a lot of people were displaced, a lot of people passed away. Um, and so were the animals as well, there were animals who were displaced. So Jill obviously came home, uh, had, had come home, I think, around the same time, and she offered to help. Um, I think John went out to help the people uh, who were stranded or trying to help with the rescues. And it was, a, it was a bunch of things that tried to help the people as well as the animals at the same time. But during that time, we had international aid come into Thailand, and they were looking for an organization working with animals to carry out spay and neuter programs. And obviously then Suida, was on their radar because of the work we were doing already and you know and and that's kind of how it started so it, it supported us to carry on with our spay and neuter program and eventually grow to what it is today so with that tra tragedy in a way it kind of opened the doors to do something bigger that's a hard way to get your name on the map it's probably not the way i would have wanted to but yes i think it's just learning from things and since then you know disaster management here i mean we're not for instance, I know in the U.S. you have a lot of hurricanes and you know a lot of natural disasters. So in Thailand, we mostly see floods, which are quite common, not so much in Phuket, but maybe in the north and other areas. So we have been called several times over the years to help. Um, I think in Bangkok we had a major flooding. I think I can't really recall the year, but somewhere maybe early 2000s, uh, maybe. And you know, and a lot of animals were stranded. And last year. Um, we had a call from Ubon province um, where animals were stranded. So we, you know, we kind of all those things help you to learn more about what you need, what you need to do, and how to help with um, liaise with government agencies to help the animals. And and we're very lucky to be able to do that. Although we're based in Phuket and our primary our shelter is only in Phuket, but we are able to help in certain situations like that where there are, where there are natural disasters or big big um, crises happening with animals we're in a position now to help which is which i think is we're very lucky and so apart from helping the animals in phuket we are also able to help we have been called upon to help in certain crises in other parts of thailand so with things like natural disasters so we had flooding last year in the ubon province which is further north from us and We've also had a situation in another northern part of Thailand where there was a rabies scare, this was a few years ago, where I think a couple of dogs were um, known to have rabies. So the community and the local government didn't know how to react to it or how to control it. So what they did was they just decided to collect all the dogs and have a makeshift shelter. And we had thousands of dogs being put in a pile, you know, into, into the shelter, which was not, not properly Manage. It wasn't meant to be a shelter, and sadly, dogs who had rabies and who didn't have rabies were all put in together. They were pets, all of them. So it was a, it was a horrific thing to have happened. And by the time we were alerted to it, um, you know, a lot of animals had already had already died. But then we managed to work with the local government, the local vets, and we vaccinated a lot of the dogs and. We're able to quarantine them, and eventually we brought a whole, um, a whole, whole lot of them down to Soida in Phuket, and we found homes for them um, all over the world. So, natural responding, responding to natural disasters and crises like that is also part of what we do, um, and it, it all again i want to take this opportunity to thank all our donors and our supporters because we've come a long way from the time when john and jill and margo were together and just helping you know they used to do spay and neutering on in backyards in their living rooms that's that's how it began but now we've come to this position where we're not just helping the dogs in phuket we're helping we're able to help in a very unique way um, to animals all over Thailand and also beyond as well, um, because we're obviously trying to work to cut down um, to, to trying to stop the dog meat trade in other countries like Vietnam and Cambodia as well. China's big in the in that as well, aren't they? Yes, they are. So we get a lot of questions asking people, "Oh, can you help 
um, you know, there are lots of issues going on. But sadly, we do not have the resources to go that far. And we are trying to focus more closer to home, which is Vietnam. And so um, this would be a good opportunity to also talk a little bit about the dog meat trade, because a lot of people know soy dog for the dog meat trade and how we were helping with with that situation. So uh, now the uh, dog meat trade is illegal in Thailand. It was um, abolished in 2013, 2014 time, and now we have uh, the first ever Animal Welfare Act came into um, came into play in 2014. So it's um, it's pretty much controlled, if not if non-existent in Thailand. But the animals who were taken from Thailand used to go to Vietnam. They were smuggled through the borders um, to. Which, in Vietnam, which is actually the second largest consumer of dog meat, um, you know, behind China. And what we're trying to do now is there are no laws there. So you can't just go in and rescue the animals and hope for the best. You have to cut it at the root. And our policy is to be proactive in trying to work with the government agencies and the government there and to try and bring in laws that will stop it all together and then you can think about other then you can think about rescuing them doing spay and neutering and kind of replicating what's happened in thailand so china is not somewhere that we can go to we're just not it's just not possible the the country the way it's run all those things but so we're working with organizations in cambodia there we're um, we're working with them to create awareness uh, we have uh, in vietnam as well it's creating awareness to showing people that this is not the way forward because majority of people in Vietnam do not consume dog meat. They all have their pets and it's their pets that sometimes who are captured for the dog meat trade. So a lot of people don't want it. So um, that's another thing I would like to emphasize because sometimes when people follow us or they hear about us, you people think that all of Asia, all of Vietnamese people, for instance, are into dog meat and, and they're, you know, they're, they're all set in this sort of middle-aged ways, but it's quite the contrary. It's just a part of the part of what happens there. And it's also, it's not really the culture, it's partly the culture, but also it's something that's been, that's just part of some people. Some people are doing it, but not everybody. And it's sometimes it's a bit of a luxury for people. So it's not because there is no other means for food. It's just something that's been going on. And it's, it's just, you can, it's just tackling that problem as it is, but it doesn't affect their culture. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a very complicated issue, so which I, I don't think we really have time to get into, but that just kind of touches on what the dog meat trade is like in Southeast Asia. Well, I think it's really important what you said for us to know that it's not uh, a general population issue, that they're not all doing it. I think that's really important for us to know because it does- Definitely. It appears that way just through the bits and pieces that you hear, you get the impression that it's- It's everyone. So I did read that you have a very beautiful veterinary facility that is almost like going to a state-of-the-art hospital, which is really fantastic. And that's a huge accomplishment in itself. Yes. So we, this was Jill's dream before she, you know, um, before her untimely passing in 2017. And we, I think, so we began, I can't remember when exactly the hospital was, um, the construction started, but it was opened um, in 2016, 2017. So it's the first of its kind um, in Asia. And it's a, uh, it's a hospital dedicated to stray dogs. So we have, we have, we could do we would like to have more equipment there but i think yes for for where we are it would do, it's, it's really good it's quite we've got we've got an x-ray machine we have an ultrasound scanner we have a dental unit um and we do all our in our bloods and you know blood checks and everything in house every day is is crazy if you ask any of our vets but we kind of have a have a routine of how things are done. So when animals come in, we have a system where we record all their details, and then we also go into um, we the animals would come in, and then we would check them in for hospital. You know, we would um, whether where they need to go, whether it's whether they need surgery, and then we have our kennels where they will live for you know for a little while until the treatment is done, and then we have a veterinary team animals who will stay with us and who will be our resident animals. So we have. Completely 
different team of vets who are going to be looking after this resident animal. So those are animals who will stay with us. Some of them will be up for adoption. And um, yeah, so that's a bit about the dog hospital. We also opened our um, dedicated feline hospital, hospitals uh, last year. And that is dedicated to the cats. So the cats used to be, um, we had a cattery that was kind of divided into the cat hospital and the resident cats. It was a very small building at the time because we didn't have that many cats. Um, and over time, the number of cats have grown as well. So we needed to make sure the hospital was away from the main cattery. So we, um, we expanded our shelter um, and that one of the one of the important buildings in the project was the cattery. So the cattery is the same. We have um, bigger kennels, um, like cat cages for them, where they have a lot more space. They have more levels, depending on how long they're staying. Um, in there as well, we have a surgery unit um, and an isolation unit, and also with cats, we because we, they have cat flu and parvo and all that as well. So we just opened up a, a new isolation unit because we had, a, we had a very, very small isolation unit and it wasn't that great. So for parvo, um, for cats and dogs and uh, uh, canine distemper, which we see every now and then. So we have um, new facilities for the animals just so that they have, we can give them the best of what we can while they're going through some of their worst times. Now, so are you all, all are you located all in one general area or is your facility spread out around Phuket? So we're all in one area. So our shelter is in Phuket. We're in the north of Phuket. It's an area called My Cow, just near the airport. Um, and yes, and then we move out, like we have uh, you know, our teams who might go out, like our community outreach team who would spread out to other parts of Phuket to, to bring animals in or to treat them. But yes, the entire shelter, all the facilities I talked about, the office, everyone is, we're all based in one location. How many dogs do you currently have? So the population varies. This year we hit uh, the highest number ever of animals we had you know, at, at one time. So these include animals who are staying with us, animals who are currently receiving treatment at the shelter. And we had at one point 1,300 animals. Um, so that's the highest we've had in a long, I think that's the highest we've ever had because just because of COVID actually, because we had a lot of animals that we wouldn't normally come in, like animals who were abandoned um, came into us. So we, I think, at, this time we, we're actually looking after about 300 plus animals, more than we would normally do um, you know, this time of the year. And where do you get the people that work for you? Are they, are they local? Do they come from all over the world? Are they volunteers? So for general day-to-day -day jobs, we have staff and it's because it's, it's just it's just so much going on, it's difficult to rely on volunteers. Mm -hmm. So majority of the staff are Thai, um, Thai locals. We have the vets are all Thai um, and the carers. We also have Burmese staff as well because um, there are a lot of Burmese people working in Thailand. So majority of the, of the uh, staff are Thai and Burmese. We also have foreigners who work with us and, and this is to do with, these are roles that um, come with experience or um, things like with the fundraising team, the marketing team, for instance, but it's a mix in our office as well. Um, we have a local adoption team, so they're all local um, type people. We have a few and few um, foreigners working in the adoption team as well, the ones who do the international adoptions. Um, so it's a mix of people, but majority local people. So I actually was looking on your adoption site. It's incredible, the stories of the dogs, and I you know, very tempted myself. <laughs> but my, I, right at the moment, we have two dogs ourselves, and um, my husband would not be happy so um, not at the moment, but you all would definitely be at the top of my list if I was looking for a dog. And I would really encourage people that are looking to look at your site. And I think adoption is just such a great choice to make. Yeah, so, the, so adopting obviously is one of the big ways that anyone can help because when you decide to adopt an animal, that means you free up a space in our shelter to have um, another animal come in. And so the adoption process, we obviously always try and adopt animals locally first. So priority is always given locally. Um, so, but unfortunately, 
as dogs get older, there is less demand, and these are the animals that end up going overseas. So these are all street animals who most of them haven't lived in a home before. They're just, you know, used to wander the streets and got ill, got hit by cars, and things like that. And they come in, we look after them, like I explained before, and then they're brought for adoption. So the adoption, um, so overseas adoptions, US and um, Canada and UK and other parts of Europe are the most common destinations for our um, adopted animals. So US definitely is, is, is also one of the easiest places to get animals to. And obviously, you know, we most of the people who adopt from us already have their own animals, they have their rescue animals. They're just reaching out to help another animal in need um, from Thailand. That was my plan. I don't want to keep you all night or all night, it's all night here. But okay, yeah. Okay, I know you're busy. So I'm going to let you go, but is there anything we haven't covered that you feel like would be important for people to know? Um, I think one of the things, I know we briefly touched on spay and neutering, but I think it's worth mentioning now um, that soy dog is actually sterilizing more animals probably than any any other organization in the world. We are close to where we're actually might be hitting 500,000 sterilizations this month. So we're, we're so excited for that and we're looking forward to making a big announcement for that. Hopefully by the time you actually have the recording go out, it might be, um, we probably would have announced that. And so that's something we're really, really excited about. And every month we sterilize about, it's coming out to an average of about 12,000 animals. And I know we said that we're primarily based in Phuket, but our, we have a massive sterilization program happening in Bangkok, where we believe where the most number of you know animal um, stray dogs are, and we are. We, and again, it's all thanks to our donors. We're also supported by the Dogs Trust Worldwide, which is the U, which is a UK charity, one of the big charities there. We're supporting us as well. And so spaying and neutering, I just can't emphasize because we, I feel a lot of our supporters knew us through the dog meat trade and how we help the animals. And spaying and neutering is not something that's exciting when you talk about, especially for another country, why would you be interested in spaying and neutering in Thailand? But with the sheer number of animals that you see, it is, like we said, the way forward, and it's really, really important. And all the rescue cases and the animals that you see with you know, these horrific injuries, they will only, the only hope for us not to see them is to decrease the population. So, um, so if anyone is interested in finding out more about Zoe Dog and about the work we do, please go to our website. Um, it's got every, everything covered there from the dog meat trade, just baby and neutering, all of, all of that is there. And of course, we're also on social media. We're very active on social media, so you can find out everything you need to know about us. Um, and I know people also ask, how do you help? So obviously donating is one way. You can also do your own fundraisers. And we're registered in the US, so you're actually also um, eligible for tax deductions if you do donate to Soy Dog, even though we're in Phuket, we're in Thailand, because we're registered also in the US, and but the money comes for the animals here. Um, so you can do your own fundraisers. We also have a merch shop if anyone is interested during this holiday season and buying anything from friends and family. So you can do all that as well. But so everything is online, so I don't wanna go into detail, but. Uh, but yes, so, and of course you can get in touch with us as well anytime, you can email us or message us and we'll be more than happy to um, answer any questions anyone might have. That's great. And I will post all of that information at the end of the video. And okay. so that will be available for everybody. Naomi, I so appreciate you taking this time and I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much, Jenny. It's been a pleasure talking to you as well. And again, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity so that more people can um, find out about how they can help. Yes, I'm really excited about it. I think you all have an amazing model and it's really exciting to hear about the work that you're doing, which is so important. All right, thank you very much. Have, have a good night. You too, have a good day.